John chapter 4. If you have a Bible, go with me over to John chapter 4, verse number 25. Can you guys hear me okay? Give me a little more volume if you don't mind. John 4, verse 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. Y'all got you there? Okay, I'll put it on the board here. When he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I love it that Jesus made himself clear to the Samaritan woman by the well. If you look at the accounts of Jesus, many times he wouldn't even answer people when they asked him who he was. And I love it that he made himself clear and well known to a Samaritan woman by the well. He says, I'm he. I'm the one that um, is Lord and Savior. I'm the one that all power is in my name. I am the God's son, the son of God. I am Emmanuel, God in the flesh. I am the Messiah that has been prophesied. It's me. And just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. But nobody asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? And then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town. And she said to the people, and this is what we're saying to people in, in Orlando and Gainesville and all over the world, come and see. A man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came. And people are coming to our church. People are coming to Jesus just because of your invite. They came out of the town and they made their way towards Jesus. And over the last few months, we've been taking a deep dive into John 4. How many of you guys have enjoyed this series? Anybody here? I think it's so important that we don't just read John 4, but we receive the spirit of evangelism that's attached to John 4. It's actually something that we receive by faith, that we are a soul-winning church, that we are about our Father's business. And I believe we find that in John chapter number 4. But here's a few things that we've learned over the last several months. Number one is that we don't have to be perfect people to share our faith. Somebody say amen. Amen. We just need to be available. This woman, by the will, had five husbands, and she was currently shacking with her living boyfriend, but God still used her to win a whole city. And if God used her, you know he can use you and me. Somebody say amen. amen. Over the last few months, we've learned that there are many styles to evangelism, but one of the most effective styles is the invitational style. This woman did not go and beat them over the head with the Bible and tell them they were going to hell. All she said is, come and see. You would be amazed of how many people you could win in your family and in your community if you would just say, come come and see. I got more joy. Just come and see. I got more peace. Just come and see. All right? There's something powerful about the invitational approach. We also learned over the last few weeks, few months, some of the attributes of Jesus we learned that Jesus was a bridge builder and a barrier breaker. And we are to be bridge builders and barrier breakers. He's speaking to a Samaritan woman when the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. He's speaking to a woman publicly in a culture in that time. A rabbi wouldn't speak publicly to a woman. He's speaking to not just any woman, a woman that sent a sinner. She's been married numerous times and now she's with her boyfriend. He's building a bridge. He's breaking breaking the barriers where other people would say, don't talk to that person. He didn't care anything about that. We learned that Jesus was committed to the works of God. Even though he was tired and hungry, he was still by the well looking for an opportunity to minister. So in Jesus, we see certain attributes like compassion. Everybody say compassion. Love. Everybody say love. Commitment. Everybody say commitment. And this is what I call the obvious attributes. But then there was other attributes of Jesus that wasn't so obvious. And today, I want to park on one, and it's wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. Jesus had wisdom when dealing with the woman by the well, and we need wisdom. So today's message is entitled, Walking in Wisdom. And I see tons of wisdom in Jesus ministering to the woman by the well, wisdom in who to talk to, And God knows we need to know who to talk to. You can't witness to everybody all the time. I'm assuming that there was a whole lot of people around the well that day, but Jesus honed in on her. And sometimes you got to make sure that you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit of who he really wants you to talk to because other people will waste your time. And we ain't got time to waste. Amen. He had wisdom in what to talk about. It was amazing that Jesus first asked her for water before he had a spiritual dialogue. That means that sometimes you have to have natural conversations with people before you get so spiritual. I love talking to people about the NBA or sports or the economy 
or themselves because people love to talk about themselves before I try to give them Jesus. You need to know what to talk about. Also with Jesus, we see the wisdom of when to talk to her. He waited for the right time for everybody else to be away. Think about it. He sent his disciples out to get some food. You know they wouldn't have left Jesus alone. You don't do that kind of stuff. You don't leave the Messiah by himself. He must have commanded them, y'all leave me alone. Why? Because he wanted them to take their prejudice lenses with them so he could minister to this woman that they would have rejected. So we see a wisdom on when to talk. You can't just bust up in your board meetings leading people to Jesus and think you're still going to have a job next week. You need wisdom. So I want to talk to you guys today about the wisdom of God. And for some of you all, this is exactly the word you need in the season that you need it. You're thinking about what job to take, you need wisdom. You're thinking about who to date or who not to date, you need wisdom. You're thinking about what to do in your marriage because there's problems, you need wisdom. You got a kid that ain't acting right and you know you need wisdom. I'm telling you there's something that is powerful but also important about the wisdom of God. And so wisdom is important. Everybody say it with me, wisdom is important. And we see its importance in Proverbs chapter 3. Pull that up on the board and check this out. Watch this. And let's read along together. Can you do that with me? Ready, read. Blessed are those who find wisdom and those who gain understanding. For she's more profitable than silver and she yields better return than gold. She's more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can be compared to her. I'm sorry, I did my head like this then I lost my place. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Jesus. Um, oh, thank you. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and those who hold fast for her will be blessed. That has everything to do with wisdom. Did you hear that? That wisdom is more valuable than gold and silver. And rubies were more valuable than, or just as valuable as gold and silver back in the day. Now rubies, you'd be like, I don't know about them rubies. But (laughs) what it's saying is that wisdom is important. We need the wisdom of God. It is one of the greatest promises in the Bible that God will give us wisdom. And I want to help you get it today. We need wisdom. Wisdom will help avoid the heartache. Wisdom will help you avoid making bad investments. Come on, somebody. Wisdom will help you process the pain of your past. Anybody ever been through something? And you say, why did that happen? You need wisdom. Wisdom will help you raise your kids well so you, so you don't kill them. Wisdom will give you answers when all of the doctors don't know what to do. And they're saying, we don't know what that is. We've ran test after test. You need the wisdom of God. Wisdom will put you in the right place with the right people at the right time. Wisdom is a gift that should be cherished by us. And it also should be sought after by us. And the Bible says in Proverbs 1.20 that wisdom cries out. You just got to tune into her frequency. Sometimes wisdom is like, no, don't date him. But you say, my biological clock is ticking. And you don't listen to the wisdom. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And sometimes we push her voice down, but it's the voice of the Holy Spirit saying no or saying yes. Because sometimes we get into good situations that ain't God. And we love to say that's what God is calling me to do, but it's a good thing. It ain't a God thing. You need the wisdom of God. It was wisdom that was crying out that told me to marry Tabitha, my wife. Before I even met her, I heard the wisdom of God saying she'll be your wife one day. Thank God. Wisdom is crying out. Come on, somebody. It was wisdom crying out when we started this Orlando location. We already had a very successful, powerful ministry in Gainesville, Florida, but God says, I've called you to expand. And now over the last three months since we've been in this building, we've seen the church more than double. Thank God that wisdom cries out. Come on, somebody. (laughs) We went from homeless to owning a $5.5 million building in the middle of a pandemic. Why? Because wisdom was crying out. While everybody else was running in fear, we were saying now is our time to build because wisdom, come on somebody, is crying out. But will you listen to what she's saying? And so I want to define wisdom for you today for those of you all who are crazy note takers like I am. Write this down. Because when we look at wisdom, you have to think of three words. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And what I found, especially reading Proverbs, it's the book of wisdom, is that these three, they show up 
like interchangeably and very close together, but they're a little bit different, and I want to define them today. Knowledge, write this down, is simply information. Everybody say information. That's what knowledge is. And the Bible in Hosea 4, 6 says that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. And so what you don't know can kill you. The devil loves for you to be in the dark. It's amazing how many degrees we have and how much information we have, but we don't know our Bible and we don't know Jesus. And it's what you do not know about the kingdom of our God that can actually hinder you from walking in your purpose and everything that God has for you. And so we need knowledge. This is a year that you need to extend your knowledge base. That's why the devil hates it when you come to church. That's why the devil hates it if you get in a small group and come to midweeks on Wednesday. He wants to keep you away from incre increasing your knowledge because when you increase your knowledge, the blessing is right behind that. Understanding, write this down, when you under it's when you understand information. It's, you have to understand the knowledge. For example, many of us know John 3, 16, right? Let's quote it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. Atheists and agnostics can quote that, but it doesn't mean they understand it. And many of us can quote scriptures that we do not fully understand. Understanding is like the spirit of wisdom and revelation that jumps off the page into your heart. It's, it's powerful because the Bible says that with all of your getting, get understanding. That means that everything that you want to get this year, you better get some understanding if you want to keep it. You get married, you need some understanding. Come on, married people. You, got, you have kids, God knows you need some understanding. You get in the business, you get a new job, you better get an understanding of what your employer wants you to do or you won't have a job in a few months because with everything that you get, you need to get understanding, all right? And so my pastor defined it this way years ago, that understanding is divine comprehension in my heart that gives me the ability to repeat something at will, okay? I ain't seen nobody writing, so let me say it again. It's divine comprehension in my heart that gives me the ability to repeat something at will. It, understanding is not just you repeating something at will. It's divine comprehension in your heart that gives birth to the ability to, for you to repeat it at will. It's divine comprehension, meaning that God has now revealed something to you. It was covered, but now you see it. He has illuminated to you. It made no sense, but now it makes perfect sense. See, that's why there's so many people that you love that don't believe in Jesus because the God of the world has blinded their eyes lest the light of the gospel shine through. What do they need? They need understanding. They need discernment, revelation, where God begins to reveal that which is hidden. That's a promise that God gives us. Okay, and so we need understanding. It's that aha moment. You ever sat under the preached word and you're like, oh, I get it. Oh, oh, Pastor Ken, that's exactly what I've been dealing with. That's understanding, you know. So we got knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. We got understanding. Everybody say understanding. But to me, the greatest of these is wisdom. You say, why is that? Because Proverbs 4, 7 says that wisdom is the principal thing. That means that it's the first thing. To me, that means that it's the main thing. And so for us, we want to be people that seek after wisdom. I always ask God for wisdom. God, I got a text. Do I respond to that text? How do I respond to that text? Should I have somebody else respond to that? Because we live in a generation that people post before they pray. And you just post all your feelings without accessing the wisdom of God. You don't need to share everything that you've ever thought or worn or eaten in your life on. I don't know if y'all ready for this today. I'm going to keep it real with you. It is the first thing, you know. Many times we see our family and friends and people that we know go through things in life. And what do we do? We want to just jump in, pay their rent, pay their bill month after month, and then you become their God. Because you never access wisdom because, because you know, we happy-go-lucky Christians and we love to turn the other cheek and overcome evil with good, but that don't mean you're supposed to be a crutch for your family. Because there are some people that won't seek God till they get to the bottom of the barrel. And you keep stepping in so that that never happens and God ain't even taking care of their need. But here you come, Mr. and Mrs. Christian, not accessing the wisdom of God, keeping them depending upon you instead of God. And it ain't wisdom. Oh, I'm preaching better than you saying amen today. It's okay. I'm going to work with y'all. I'm back from Chicago, and I'm rest to go. 
And so wisdom is the principal thing. And so what is wisdom? I'll give you a threefold um, definition. It's operational insight. It's the cleverness of God. And it's also the proper use of knowledge. That's how I would define wisdom. Operational insight. That's where God shows you things in the operating of something that you could not have gotten unless he helped you. For example, when Noah built the ark, he didn't go to boat building school. He got operational insight. The Bible says that it had never rained on the earth, but he's out here building a boat. That has to be the wisdom of God. It's what we call operational insight. When there's a problem at your job and everybody else is stumped, it's like, what are we going to do? Profits are going down. We had a horrible quarter. And all of a sudden, here you come with the answer that everybody else needs to see the company move forward. See, that's why Joseph was preferred. That's why Daniel was preferred. Daniel had a spirit of excellence on him, but he also had a mantle of wisdom. He knew how to interpret the king's dreams. He knew things that other people did. Oh, y'all, you're supposed to know things that people do not know that don't have a relationship with God. But many of us are Googling what we should be going to God for. And it's operational insight. Moses built a tabernacle with the wisdom of God. Are y'all hearing me today? Nehemiah built a whole wall, and he wasn't a builder. He was a cupbearer. Operational insight. Write this down. Cleverness of God. What's that? Um, here's an example. So when we bought this building here in Orlando, um, we wanted to lease. We were just looking to lease. We didn't feel like we had the money to purchase. 2020, we was right in the middle of a pandemic. We said we just wanted to lease something. So we started negotiating a lease for this building, and Tesla came in and wanted to buy it. So the owner didn't want to deal with us. They wanted, they wanted Tesla's money. It was God versus Tesla. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we started praying and say, God, we need you to move the mountain. And so he moved Tesla down the street. I don't know if you see them. They down the street now, praise God. <laughs> they are. They down the street. And they bought a building that was more than this one, and we didn't even want that one. We saw that one. We said, God, give us this one, right? But in the midst of it, the Lord says, they don't, know, they don't want to lease it any longer. They want to sell it. And at the time, we didn't have the money or the resources to buy it. I think they wanted $3 million for it. And the Lord says, offer them $100,000 down and tell them to hold the note, make a balloon in three years, amortize it over 30 years at 5% interest. So we go and write a contract, and our brokers thought we were crazy. Like, we don't even want to present this offer. I said, present the offer. Present the offer. We put the offer in. They accept our offer. And so what that meant was that they didn't have to pay taxes on the building. We didn't have to do the maintenance on the building because now we own the building. And what we thought was going to take us three years, then God caused over $1.5 million to come in over a span of about 10 months. We got another bank, refinanced the whole thing, paid them off in six months, what we thought was going to take three years. That is the cleverness of God. I know that's too much information for some of y'all. That's the cleverness of God. That's when God makes you smarter than what you really are. And we all should have that cleverness. The wisdom of God is available for all of us. There's a story in the Bible about King Solomon, and he was having a dispute with these two moms. They both had a baby. One baby died. And so now they were fighting over one baby. And one mother was like, no, it's my baby. The other mother was like, no, it's my baby. And they brought the matter to King Solomon. King Solomon says, you know what we're going to do? Cut the baby in half. Give one side to one mom and one side to the other mom. The one mother was like, okay, well, whatever you want to do, let's do it. But then the other lady said, no, don't cut the baby. Just let her have it. And King Solomon said, aha, that's the real mother there. And his fame went around the world because he had the cleverness of God. Wisdom is also the proper use of knowledge. Are y'all here with me today? The proper use of knowledge. The Bible commands us to love, but it doesn't tell us how. See, the command to love is knowledge. How to love is wisdom, because you can't love everybody the same way. The Bible commands us to give knowledge. How to give, what to give, and who to give to is wisdom. Knowledge is the gun. When to use the gun is wisdom. And so let's look at a few scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want you guys to read this along with me. We'll put it on the board. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. It says, yet among the mature, we impart wisdom. Everybody say, we impart wisdom. 
Although it's not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And so this is not a natural wisdom. Now, here's the deal. There's a lot of people who have natural wisdom and they're making a lot of money and developing phones and winning Nobel Peace Prize, but that wisdom is natural and will not last for eternity. But I'm not talking about natural wisdom today. I'm talking about the wisdom of God that is not a natural wisdom. It is a supernatural wisdom that will have eternal benefits with it. And so what the Bible says here is that we impart that wisdom. It's not a wisdom that you go to school for. It's not a wisdom that you get just by study. It's a wisdom that you receive it by faith. And so today's message is about us imparting. Do you know what I mean by that? It's a spiritual thing. And that's why when you come to church, you really should open yourself up to receive what God has for you. It is a sharing. There is a deposit of the wisdom of God today. How many of you all could handle that? Okay, let's go with me over to Proverbs 24, Proverbs 24, Proverbs 24, let's look at verse number three, let's read it together on the board, it says, by wisdom a house is built, by understanding it's established, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches, a wise man is full of what? Strength, a man of knowledge enhances his what? Might, but for by guidance you can wage your war in an abundance of counselors, there's victory. Mm. Wisdom is too high for a fool, <laughs> and in the gate, he doesn't open his mouth, all right? Now, the principle that I want you to pay attention to is verse number three. It says, by wisdom, a house is built. By wisdom, a house is built. By wisdom, his house is, is built. You don't go and build a house without the blueprints of where the bathroom is going to go, so you got to step back for a moment. Have the, you got to do things decent and in order. But what I've realized, it's not just that a wisdom, that a house is built by wisdom. A church is built by wisdom. A business is built by wisdom. A family is built by wisdom. Your life is going to be built by wisdom. Why are people getting the 60 and 70 and upset with the fruit of their life? Because they didn't build by wisdom. Wisdom wants you to construct properly because it sees ahead the things that you can't see right now. Are y'all here with me today? Go to Ephesians 5 and watch this one. It says, be very careful then how you live. Okay? Go ahead and tell your neighbor, you got to be careful this year. Not as unwise, but as, are y'all with me today? There's two categories that we can all fall into with every decision that we make. It can be wise. It can be unwise. And when you make wise decision, you have good fruit. And when you make an unwise decision, it jacks your life up. Now, just tell the truth. How many of y'all have ever made an unwise decision before? And you're like, why in the world I marry you? This is crazy. I can't stand. Why am I working with these crazy ratchet people? Like, if I would have just accessed the wisdom of God, I would have stayed where I was. Right? And so we need to make sure that we don't do unwise things. And so I want to give you some very common unwise things people do. Are y'all ready for this? Are y'all ready? Unwise things that's so common nowadays. All right, y'all ready? Missionary dating. That's when you are dating somebody who's not saved with hopes that you're going to get them saved. <laughs> Say it with me, unwise, unwise. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you don't marry for potential because everybody got potential, but it never, it does not mean that potential will ever be lived out. It's amazing, but pastor, he got potential. What, what is that, what has that got to do with it? Does he have any fruit? Does he have a job? Does he have his teeth? I mean, my God, it's just unwise. So you need to wait. See, being single and fulfilled is a lot better than being married for 50 years trying to drag somebody to church with you for 50 years because they have no spiritual zeal because they wanted you more than they wanted him. It's unwise. Marrying somebody without premarital counseling. I'm coming for you today. Praise God. <laughs> somebody shout, it's not wise. <laughs> Just like you take driver's ed before you drive a car. Just like hopefully you go to medical school before you operate on somebody. <laughs> you need to have premarital counseling before you go up and sign up for a lifetime of warfare. 
All the married people know that I'm telling the truth. <laughs> yeah, that's true, Pastor. It's been warfare. It's been crazy around here. But I believe we can win in warfare if you, if you got the right tools. All right, here's un- otherwise unwise things. People that leave their spouse and family because they believe it's going to be easier or they're going to be more happy by themselves. Would somebody shout unwise? The amount of people that I see wanting to leave their marriage and family because they think the grass is greener on the other side, I have an announcement for you today, and you are being lied to by Satan. And every good lie sounds like the truth, but it ain't true at all. Let me give you wisdom. I've been doing this for a long time. Most people who do that come back in two years, and they're more unhappy then than they've ever been, and their spouse done moved on to marry somebody else. And they get into deeper sadness and deeper depression because they wasn't wise. They blame their relationship on the other person instead of owning the part that they play. And I wish that people would just go in for counseling, not just marriage counseling. Some of y'all need individual counseling. Come on. You need to get the junk out of the trunk. You need to deal with your prejudice and your biases. You need to deal with the lies that you believed over the years. You need to break the generational curses. Come on, somebody. You got to deal with you, and then all of a sudden, it is easier to live with each other. Here's another one. They take advice from the, from the wrong people. <laughs> Somebody shout unwise. unwise. This one's common, you all. So in the 21 days of prayer and fasting, my kids, they all fast and everything, right? They got their own little thing that they do. And I don't really think they have a problem with giving up food for whatever reason. My 16-year-old looked at me and said, I'm just going to do a full fast. I'm just going to do a full fast. I'm like, that's amazing, but have you prayed? Have you studied? Because I don't know why it's easy for them. So I always like to ask them, that's cool that you're giving up food, but what did you get from God's word? Are you spending time in the presence of God? So my 10-year-old, my son, he was about to head to school, got his helmet on. He's in the, he's in the garage, and I tried to hit him with this question. I said, man, how's fasting going? He says, good. You know how you do. And then I said, um, I said what have you been studying? What has God been speaking to you? And I thought he was going to say, Nothing, you know, but he said, I've been reading the Bible, and the Bible says um, that bad company corrupts good character. And so that means that I need to be very careful of who I hang out with. He's 10 years old. Come on, somebody. He's 10 years old. I said, wow. I was amazed. And some of y'all 37 years old and don't have that kind of wisdom that your friends, come on somebody, if you show me your friends, I can prophesy your future. You need to have some people in your life that got fruit in their life to be able to speak into your life. That brother dropped wisdom on me and got on his bike and rode to school. I said, I can't believe this. What in the world? I remember years ago, I was going to a therapist. And just, I went like a couple times, he had been referred to me by other pastor friends. And I went to him. And I could just tell, talking to him, that his life was crazy. It was jacked up. And I made a decision after two sessions, I can't go back to you because how are you going to speak into my life and your life is tore up? It's amazing, those of you all who let people who have no fruit tell you anything about the Bible or about God or about marriage or about the kingdom of our God or, or hell or demonology or eschatology or anything else. I, those are words I know you don't know, but what I'm saying is that please go to somebody that has a track record of fruitfulness. And so, anyway, I think it's unwise. Oh, here's another one. Buying more house just because you can afford it. Would somebody shout unwise? There is something about living beneath your means. There is something about living a life of margin. Come on, somebody. It's less stressful when you got more money than month. Come on, somebody. But when you got more month than you do money, oh, my God, it's a bad month. You tell me. Is the wisest person the person who buys a million dollar house but still owes a million dollars on it? Or is it the person who pays $250,000 for a little house but it's paid off? The world will celebrate you for having the million dollar house. And truthfully, I want to come over and watch the game. (laughs) Just to be honest with you. But it, it ain't wise all the time. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's like, you know what, leave a legacy. You know, you know what? Live, live debt-free. That, that would be more wisdom, all right? All right, here's another one. Unwise, people who fill their heart with so much fantasy that you can't even tell the real thing now when it shows up. Somebody say unwise. 
Now, here's the deal. I never want to be the pastor that tells you what music to listen to and what movies to go to. You know, back in the day, the church always trying to control people. Not always. This is a very general, stereotypical statement. But many of you guys went through churches, and it was like, you can't dance or you're going to hell. Or you can't have a goatee and you're going to hell. And it became so legalistic and dogmatic that I never want to be that person. But I do love you enough to let you know that wisdom cries out. And there are some things that if you put in your ear and put in your eyes, it's going to mess up your heart. I can't give it to you as a law and say, thou shalt not. But I can say, doggone, it might not be wise. For example, on Tabitha's birthday, we went to see a movie that I really wanted to see. It was the 355. Have y'all seen the commercials for that? Like, I'm a James Bond fan, and I love action movies, and it was these women, they came together from different nations, and they were like secret agents. And I was watching the previews, like, oh, shoot, that's going to be crazy. Like, they're going to go, and they're going to be shooting folks and everything. And so on her birthday, I said, sweetheart, she hates those kind of movies, but it was her birthday, so. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, let's go to the movie. And she says, is there anything good out? I said, what is 355 movie? You know, you know girl power, you a pile woman, I, you know, makeup stuff. <laughs> We saw so many people killed in two hours. <laughs> I had never seen more people, and it was PG-13. We saw more deaths. And so usually we're not frustrated with each other, and we don't have tons of arguments and stuff like that, but we came out of the movie on her birthday, and I could tell she was on edge. And she started asking me questions about <laughs> the Bible and all kinds of stuff, and I just had to be like, Sweet, sweetheart, what's going on? And I realized that we had digested so much murder and, and the crazy thing is, is sometimes when you listen to music and you say, well, it's just about the beat, but those words are creating death or life. You want to check out the words of what's being said. And so, well, it's just the movie, but how much, sometimes we are entertained by evil and don't even know it. So now when holiness and character and the flow of the Spirit show up, we don't even know what's real versus what's fake. We think that Jesus is like an avenger. We've filled ourselves so much up with fantasy that we're no longer sensitive to when evil shows up. And I cannot tell you what to do, but I will say this and write this down. Is that just because something is permissible doesn't mean that it's wise. We live in a generation of people that want to debate, well, is that in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? No, but wisdom cries out. Is that leading you to Jesus? Or could it be hindering your relationship with Jesus and you decide? So you say, Pastor, what does this have to do with soul winning? So glad you asked. It has everything to do with soul winning. If we are going to change the world by changing your world, you need to have wisdom in witnessing. So I'm coining this term today, wisdom in witnessing. Say it with me, wisdom in witnessing. Say it again. <laughs> Colossians 4 and 5, it says this. Here it comes. It says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And I want to give you five foolish things people do in witnessing that we have to avoid because I don't want you to be, you know, some Christians, they, they're spooky. They are. They scare folks. And I want you to be spiritual, but I don't want you to be spooky. I don't want you to be the Christian with the huge cross at work on your computer and the bottle of oil that you just throw around the office. I don't want you to be that person praying in tongues at the, at the conference table and nobody knows what you're talking about. I, I, w I want you to be spiritual, but I don't want you to be spooky pooky. <laughs> Five foolish things people do in witnessing. Number one, they judge people by how they look on the outside. Don't do this. Love people beyond their hairstyles, their tattoos their dress, the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their education, their standards. Remember Tabitha would go to church years ago and never got saved. She went to church all the time when we were in college, but she never got saved because she was completely unchurched. She didn't have church people clothes. She had what she wore to the club the night before, which was probably a little bit of higher skirt. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> she, had a, she had a piercing in her eye, a big hoop up here, earrings all around. A little, a little cleavage showing, praise God. And, um, and the people in the church, they never led her to Jesus. I mean, this went on for a long time because they judged her by how she looked, not knowing that she would be a woman of God that would preach around the world. Number two, 
Don't people say no for people without even talking to them about Jesus. Think about the number of people that are in your life that you haven't invited to church yet. Selah. And you say, well, we work together and I don't want things to get weird. But you want to go to hell? I mean, what is this? Or you say, well, I know they're another faith. I don't think they're going to be comfortable here. So what we do, we become professional recruiters of other Christians. So we see people that got a cross on, and then we start conversation. Oh, you saved? Oh, I'm saved too. And then we recruit people like our church might be better than their church. That's what we do. We go for the low-hanging fruit and just try to bring people from other churches. And I just don't believe that's what Jesus meant when he said, go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He's talking about the Hindus and the Muslims and the atheists and the agnostic and the people that got their face covered. And you say, I don't know if they're going to be comfortable here. Yes, because God is here. There's going to be conviction here. There's going to be power here. There's going to be forgiveness here. There's gonna, come on, somebody. Yes, that's exactly who we want in the house. Come on. That's exactly who we want here. Number three. We preach at them more than building a bridge to them. It's what I also call Bible thumping. And what I've learned over the years is don't try to clean people before you catch them. I do not expect unsaved people to act like a Christian. I am never upset at the world acting like the world. That's what they're supposed to do. I don't go and tell people to get their lifestyle together or God's going to do this, that, and the other. I give them Jesus. We're all sinners. And most people know in their heart if they're a sinner. And Jesus died for sinners. And then after they accept Jesus, I'll help them live like Jesus. Are y'all with me today? Okay. During Tabitha's surgery, you know, it was January last year. We're going in for a double mastectomy. It's a big deal. You know, like, oh, my God, she's about to have surgery. It's going to be crazy. And it was like 6 in the morning, and there's not a lot of people in the waiting room. We're first in this big, huge waiting room. And then our, our, um, my wife gets out of surgery, and they put us in a smaller waiting room. And I had seen this gentleman. This gentleman was probably in his 60s, is my assumption. I'm in my 40s, and I'm thinking, man, I hope this guy got wisdom for me. I hope this guy maybe could encourage me. And so here we are, and now we're in a room with about five chairs, and it's me and this, this guy. And my wife just came out of surgery. His wife just came out of surgery, and he looks at me, and he starts preaching to me. He doesn't ask my name. He doesn't ask me how I feel. He doesn't ask me how my day is. He starts preaching to me um, about faith, and people think faith is this, but it's that. And Abraham, they think Abraham was born here, but he's born there. He's getting all doctrinal and all into this stuff. Then he starts talking bad about preachers on TV, and Creflo Dollar says this, and he's saying all this stuff, but you don't even know my name. You didn't offer me prayer for my wife. You didn't even think enough to say, man, you're in your 40s and I want to comfort you. I know I got 20, 30 years on you, but let me give you wisdom of how to get through this season. He didn't care anything about me. He just wanted to be right. And the truth is, if that what Christianity is, you can keep it. But thank God that ain't what Christianity is. That is a lack of wisdom. You want to preach to me without loving me. Preach to me without having compassion towards me. Preach to me with no mercy and preach to me with no grace. Keep your preaching to yourself. I'm talking about wisdom and witnessing. Number four, they waste too much time with people that ain't ready yet. Wisdom knows the difference. Very quickly, there's a, a, like a homeless couple and they have the whole family on a street near where I live. And they got like a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, very quickly. And I go past all the time, and I'm praying for them, God, da-da-da-da. And I decided I'm going to stop, and I'm going to see what I can do to help. This is the Saturday night before Big Give Sunday. I got $70,000 that I'm ready to give to somebody. So I have a 40-minute conversation with them people, and I say, listen, I want to pay your rent. I want to take care of you. I am the answer to your prayers. It's 10 o'clock at night. All I need you to do is I'm going to pick you up for church in the morning. Leave your stuff in the hotel. Put the kids in my truck. I'm coming to get you. I'm taking care of everything. They started making up excuses and this, that, and the other. And all of a sudden, the wisdom of God kicked in. They ain't ready yet. And sometimes we force it. 
But somebody, they got a scheme. They got, I'm not saying that that was the case, but they got something else that's more important than God right now. They got their own thing that they're work, their own thing they want to do. They're not ready for Jesus yet. They got a hustle on the side. And sometimes wisdom is crying out, but we keep trying to push past wisdom. That's the difference. Sometimes we waste time on people when there's all kinds of people around you that are hurting. And here's my last one. They give up because of their initial objections. People stop witnessing because people say, I don't want anything to do with that. I was in Los Angeles. We were doing missionary work out there. And I mean, we took like 30 people out with us and we combined with thousands of people. We're hitting the streets. We're in tent city. We're feeding people. We're clothing people. We're building furniture for orphans. I mean, we're doing it. An Uber driver picks me up, and he's seen us all with the same shirt on. He said, man, what y'all doing? I start telling people, telling them, man, we clothing people. We helping people. We bringing the love of Jesus to Los Angeles. And he says, man, that's cool. So my next thought is, hey, bro, so where's your walk with God? Do you believe in God? He says, well, I believe a little bit of this religion, a little bit of that religion, a little bit of this religion. And frankly, I don't really care about it, organized religion too much. And I said, okay, well, tell me a little bit about where you're from. What have you been through in your life? What, what have you experienced? And he begins to talk to me. And I had a 40-minute Uber drive. And wisdom helped me time this thing perfectly. I knew to give him space to be comfortable with me and talk on his platform for 30 minutes. And I'm looking at my drop-off time. And when 10 minutes hit, I started switching the conversation. And I began to share my testimony with him of how Tabitha overcome 12 years of depression, how we came out of $100,000 of debt and God prospered us when we were in business. I began to tell him how our marriage was headed for divorce, but now we're best friends and been married for 22 years. And then I timed it. As soon as he dropped me off at the hotel, he says, I'm done. I said, hey, man, can I invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Can I pray the prayer of salvation with you? And he says, quite certainly, I would love to do that. I didn't get into the ring of his objections. I just gave him the answer because wisdom was telling me, don't get over in the weeds. Just tell him who I am. Tell him about the blood. Tell him about the cross. Tell him about, about my love. I got to bypass his intellect and go after his heart. Is this thing on today? Do you hear what I'm telling you today? And so today he's born again. His name is found in the book of life because I had wisdom in witnessing. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, well, how do I get the wisdom? Anybody here want the wisdom of God? Come on, anybody here want the wisdom of God? Come on online. Does anybody here want the wisdom of God? It's available for all of God's children. James 1 verse 5 says it this way. James 1 and 5, ready, go. If any of you lack wisdom, all you got to do is ask for it. That's all you, you ain't got to beg for it. You ain't got to be a perfect person. You got to ask, but you got to have a faith that you receive it. Because he gives generously to all without fault finding. God doesn't want to shame us, make us feel bad about all the mistakes that we've made. But when you ask, you got to believe and not doubt. Because they took away the scripture. Why they do that? Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And so today I want to give us a moment just to ask God for wisdom. Can we do that? But I want you to receive it by faith today. This is not a wisdom that you study for. It's one that's imparted. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, can you just take a moment and ask God for wisdom? Wisdom in business. Wisdom in stewardship of finances. Wisdom in overcoming depression. Wisdom in decisions that you need to make this week, this month, this year. It's available for the asking. I saw the Lord... He said, he said to me, I'm bringing clarity. There's someone who's here and things have been muddy. And God is bringing clarity for you. Clarity, clarity. There's nothing like just a clear decision. So we believe we receive it by faith. And right now I pray for every person who's here. I pray that the mantle of wisdom is falling in this place. If you're a person of faith, if you want to put your hands up, two hands up, just receive it like manna falling from heaven. I declare the impartation of wisdom right now. Operational insight, the cleverness of God, the proper use of knowledge, the wisdom that Solomon had, the wisdom that Jesus had, we receive it now. Witty ideas and inventions be released. Answers that people can't come up with be released. In the name of Jesus.
we receive it by faith. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. We love you. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, all wisdom starts with accepting Jesus as the Lord of your life. And there's many people who are here today that if you were to die today, God forbid, you wouldn't be sure where you would spend the rest of eternity. You've been tossed to and fro about what to believe, but you know there's something that's authentic here. And God is saying that if you take a step towards me, I'll take two towards you. This is a day of fresh starts and new beginnings. And so if you're here today and you can admit that you've ever sinned, the Bible says that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But thank God that we don't have to pay the price for our sin. Jesus paid it for us. He was our ransom. He paid the price for our sin. So you don't have to be a perfect person to be a forgiven one. You just have to surrender. And so if you're here today, I'm going to ask you to pray this five-second prayer with me that will change your eternal destiny. I don't do religion, but if you want a relationship with God, if you want to know Jesus for who he is, the presence of the Lord is in this place today. And on the count of three, if you would like for me to pray with you online or here, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand so that I can know who I'm praying for. And so if that's you today and you say, Pastor, I want to be saved, I want to be born again, I want to be forgiven of my sins, I want to have a relationship with God, it starts with this prayer. If that's you, please lift your hand in one, two, three. Lift it up high right now, all over the building. Be bold and say, yes, here I am. Thank you. I see your hand and 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 your hand. You all can put your hands down. Is there anybody else here that says, Pastor, I should have lifted my hand, but I didn't? Maybe you've been Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. You've been a churchgoer, but you're not sure that your name would be found in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you want to have a relationship with Jesus for yourself. You might be 99.9% sure that you're saved, but you're not 100% certain. I want to pray for you as well. If that's you, just slip up your hand and say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. Pray with me. I need to make certain today. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand and your hand. And nobody prays alone. This whole thing is so easy. It's a belief in your heart and a confession with your mouth. Can we pray together? Say this with me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I give you me. I give you my will for your will. My life for your life. I believe you died for my sins. So I turn away from my sin and I turn towards you. Lord Jesus, thank you for healing me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. From this day forward, I'm yours and you're mine. In Jesus' name, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.